Patrick, when I was in your lab last summer, I really enjoyed learning about how you're working on the neuroscience of free will. Um, how have things progressed? What have you been doing since then? And uh, particularly trying to study the, the activity of the brain in what you call the sensory motor time scales. Just to recap, what we've been trying to do is to decode by measuring the EEG signals on the scalp of healthy participants, mm -hmm. whether the participant is about to make a movement with their right hand or with their left hand. Decode by that you mean being able to predict ahead of time what they will do before sometimes they know it themselves. Exactly. So we're trying to read out in real time the internal signals from the brain which will drive this free choice of whether to move left or move right. Now, if we can do that, there are then lots of interesting experiments we can try and do. So, for example, if we can detect the intention on a single trial, we can play games with the participants so we can... And cheat. Uh, well, I wouldn't quite put it like that, but if we know that the person is about to move their left hand, we could, for example, ask them to move their right. Now, that might be a rather interesting situation. I can imagine it could be frustrating in an interesting way when you're about to do one thing and you're told to do another. But the, the th real thing that we've been working on in the last six months is trying to get these, the decoding of these single trial intentions working well. And the, What's your success rate in predicting ahead of time? Well, then, then you're jumping ahead of time in the story because that's the end point of the story. And the, the good news is that we can get 85% correct prediction of whether the person is going to press left or press right. When 50 would be random. 50 would be random. So let's just look at the science behind all of this. Mm. So there's a field called Brain Computer Interfaces, BCI, which has exploded in recent years. It's got enormous application potential because if you can read single trial intentions from the brain, for example, of a paralyzed patient, sure. you may be able to use those signals to control the robot and thus to 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 restore some sort of agency and ability to control their life to people who, who can't move normally. Now, in the brain-computer interface world, the way that they uh, use the brain signal to drive the computer and drive a robot or whatever the person is trying to control is by a technique called mental imagery. So effectively, the, per the person is asked to think of moving their left hand and think of making a repetitive opening and closing movement with their left hand or think of making a repetitive opening and closing movement of your right hand and the signals build up over the motor areas of the brain and the computer which is trying to decode these signals will get a stronger and stronger signal giving evidence that the person is thinking of moving their left or thinking of moving their right hand. And after several seconds, often 20 or 30 seconds, the computer will think, okay, well, we've got enough evidence now that we know that this person means left rather than right. And we got all that to work. That was all fine. But then we realized that that's not what we mean by free will. So this is a thing that comes up again and again if you do research on free will, that you do something, you think, well, that's not what we mean by free will. But the, the intuition really was this, that when people make decisions in, in, their, in the world outside the laboratory, it's really quick. A lot of the significant actions in our lives seem to be um, planned, executed, and experienced in less than a second. And the brain-computer interface approach, based on mental imagery, operates over multi-second time scales, so 30 seconds. Is There's a significant short. difference. Significant difference. So we really faced a challenge that in our experiments on human volition, we wanted to work with what you might call snap decisions. Right, I'm going to go left, I'm going to go right. But the method that we had for actually getting at the neural signals from the brain that were the precursors of people's choices were really too slow. So in the last six months, what we've been doing is we've been trying to bridge that gap between the slow 30-second timescale mm. of, mm. of mental imagery and the rapid sub-second timescale of, of human action. And we've got some progress because what we found is that if you train um, people to use a brain-computer interface type device and get them to, uh, first of all, make actions with their left hand or with their right hand, and then just simply think about making actions with their left hand or with their right hand. 
your algorithm, the computer algorithm which, algorithm, which is reading all of the EEG signals from the scalp, can get good at decoding whether the person is thinking of making left-hand movements or thinking of making right-hand movements. If you now take that algorithm into a very different and much faster task, which is more like the way that we actually decide, it will still work. Now, let me explain a little bit more about what I mean by that. We've trained our algorithm so that we can detect these sort of slow, ongoing thoughts about moving the left hand and moving the right hand. And then we're going to transfer the participant to what we call a pre-queuing task. So in the pre-queuing task, you give them a little cue or advance signal, which is going to say, use your left hand to press a button, or use your right hand to press a button, or sometimes the cue will actually be a double-headed arrow, which means make up your own mind whether you're going to press left or right. Now, don't do it now. Get ready to do it, be prepared, and then just wait. And then about a second later, there'll be just a green light, which is a go signal, and that means now do it. Now, the critical thing is what's happening during this interval between the cue, which allows the person to prepare which action they're going to make, left or right, and then the go signal when they actually do it. That's a pretty short time window. It's, it's around a second. If you look at the signals that we can get out of the brain during that one second interval, we found that we can now decode those as well. And we can decode those to around 85% uh, accuracy in the best participants we test. Not in everybody. Some people don't do so well, but we can get up to around 85%. And that's, I think, the point where we can say that we can read out the signals that correspond to people's actual, mm. real-life, rapid action decisions. And now I think we're in a stage where we can begin to use those signals and try to do experiments with them. So the good news is that we've now got a system for reading out single trial intentions at sensory motor time scales. That means we've got a, a window into people's intentions before they move. And then the question will be, how can we investigate what the mechanisms of those intentions are? What's your hope? How far can you push the experimental design? Well, um, I think we'll never be able to push it quite as far as we would like. So that's the nature of experiments. You can't, you have to do what's possible, not only what you would wish to do, and also you have to do what's ethical. <laughs> so, for example, one of the uh, um, uh, obvious differences in brain computer interface is that in the rare cases where surgeons can record from the brain directly inside the head, they have a much better decoding accuracy sure. than the sorts of uh, accuracy that you can achieve just by placing electrodes on the scalp of healthy participants. So um, how far can one hope to go? Well, I think for me, the interesting question, it, there are two interesting questions. The first one is, do we begin to see any buildup in the single trial intention read out of the neural codes in the brain before the person is conscious that they are going to go left or going to go right. So that's really just a new way of doing the kind of Libet experiment mm. that we've discussed already. Okay, We've now got a method of decoding single trial intentions. If we can add to that a method for indicating the time that people feel they decide whether to go left or right, we might be able to have a new way of looking at whether First, the brain develops the intention to go left and right, and then you become aware of it, which is what neurobiologists believe, or alternatively, whether first you make up your mind to go left and right, or left or right, and then the brain starts to do it, which is what, if you were an incompatibilist or libertarian free will uh, believer, you would believe. So that's one thing that we can do. What about uh, frustrations? Uh, well, where, where have you seen some roadblocks that you wish weren't there? So the biggest roadblock is that the signals we work with are difficult to decode because they are caused by the tiny electrical signals that come out of the individual neurons in the motor areas of the brain, to which we have only very direct access by recording using EEG electrodes on the scalp. Mm -hmm. So what this means is that um, to decode these signals well, we need to have participants who, in whom we can get a good, uh, relatively noise-free recording. 
And we need to have participants who can, if I can put it this way, really think hard about going left or going right, and really try, really try to think, I'm going to go left or I'm going to go right. So the motivation of the participant in a brain-computer interface or intention decoding experiment is really, really important. This is something that's also seen in all of the clinical projects which are attempting to use BCI to, to, to restore movement to paralyzed patients is the patients really got to be motivated for these systems to work. It seems to be a general groundswell among some philosophers and even some neurophysiologists to undermine you and some others who would claim that your work shows that the traditional model of free will that we imagine, the folk conception that I'm really in control of myself, is false. So there, there are people who would undermine your work in terms of its interpretation. Well, uh, I'm... All I can do is do the best work I can and put it out there and hope to have intelligent and, re and, intelligent and reasoned debate with all of the people who are, who are interested. Uh, it's a tricky area and there is a lot of controversy. And um, I think one has to choose perhaps whether, to, whether science should just uh, not even try to tackle the controversial areas or should try to shed light on them. And, Different people may, may have different views about that. So one criticism which people have often made of, of the scientific work in this area, perhaps including my own, is that it doesn't really capture what we mean by our free will and by our free decisions. So I, I agree with that. What we study in the laboratory situation is a very simplified and very reduced version of human action. I think that's actually fine. I think it's the job of science to simplify and perhaps to strip away some of the complicated issues that surround who we are and to try to get to some of the core elements of, of who we are. And I'll give you one, I think, particularly important example. In, in philosophy, people often think about free will as being decisions, the capacity to make decisions in a way which is reasons responsive. So I might choose to press with my left hand or to press with my right hand for a particular reason, mm -hmm. because it's better, because mm -hmm. I earn more money by <laughs> doing so, because it makes me feel good, because it's the right thing to do. These are all reasons. Now, I would be the first to say, in the work that, that I've been doing recently, we're actually removing the reasons. We want to get them out of the equation. The person is making a completely arbitrary decision to press left or press right. It doesn't matter which they do. Nothing rides on it. Mm -hmm. Now, then you have to make a value judgment. Is, is the process, is it, is it useful to study the process that makes decisions after stripping away all of the value and importance and, uh, if you like, moral power that those decisions can sometimes carry? Now, personally, I think it is because I'm really interested in what the actual brain process is that ultimately has to come up with I'm going left or I'm going right. Because at the end of the day, it's what we do that matters. And the actions that we perform are extremely significant morally and legally. And the process that forces us, if you like, to come up with one action rather than another, I think should be studied.